Good morning, everybody. I'm Christina. This is Cassidy. We are here from the Missouri Botanical Garden, but today we are at the Sophia M. Sachs Butterfly House. And we are here today with Fred. Good morning. And he's going to take us through today um, an experience of what you would get if you were to come here on one of the tours that they're offering. So right now they have the under the big top theme going on as well of course as the conservatory that you all know and love. So he's going to take us through and show us a little bit of that. Sure. And go yeah. ahead Fred. We've got Professor Von Flytraps moved in with his world famous Arthropod Circus so we're going to take a, a tour into the butterfly house and see some of his uh, friends that have come along. As Christina mentioned we do tours on Mondays and we're open to general public advanced tickets required of course Tuesday through Sunday right now. So follow me we'll head on in. So of course, no circus is complete with a spectacular sideshow act. We have here is Professor Von Flytrap's Sideshow Spectacular, which showcases some amazing arthropod performers and their friends. On our wall, we can see the posters of some of these world famous performers. And on display, we have several of their amazing friends. We have, of course, all of us have our favorites here. A couple of mine are multi-limbo here. A world-class juggler is a, um, Millipede, because of their multiple legs, makes them a lot more adept at juggling. And our friends are right down here. I'm not sure how well we'll get to see them, Malaysian millipedes. So the butterfly house, we're a lot more than just butterflies. Butterflies are, are kind of the main attraction, but we have a lot of other arthropod invertebrate friends here for folks to see. We have our millipedes. We have some hermit crabs. And for those that may have seen the news a few months ago at the beginning of the pandemic, we're also home to some mantises. And one of our favorite things to show off are some mantises that hatched here, well, emerged here from their Lithica from a confiscated shipment that we are asked to help take care of. And we'll see if you can find them. And living in here is one of those mantises. It is a deadleaf mantis. And as the name implies, its main job is to look like a dead leaf. I'm not sure is if that you over there. It. Yeah, right in that back corner. Oh wow! So this is a mantis that emerged in March, late March, around the same time as my kids' birthdays. So it's actually easy to remember. So this is about what are we in month? August eight now. So about a five-month-old. Mantis. Wow. Pretty amazing at blending in. And this was a, a right, you said a confiscated shipment? Yep, in, in March we were asked um, by the Fish and Wildlife if we could take on some confiscated egg cases. There are folks who want these as part of their personal collection. Of course, there are legal and not quite as legal means of getting them. And these guys were being imported illegally and they were confiscated by Fish and Wildlife. And we are one of the facilities that was asked to take on. Uh, more than a handful of Uthika, which are the egg cases. And after all of them that emerged, we had about 500 newly emerged mantises that we were caring for at uh, late March, early April. Wow. And um, it's a lot of mantises. Of course, not all of them. They're by design. These animals play the numbers game, so not all of them survive even the first few days of coming out. But uh, this was one of those initial 500, and he, he or she has made it about five months now. We have a few others. We have another one in the other case over here. This allows us to give our tour guests the chance to see these and still maintain a safe distance. So one of, like all the other garden properties, we are providing as safe as possible an experience as we can while we all navigate this pandemic together. Is this a different kind of mantis? This is the same kind of mantis. This wow. guy is just a little bit different, a little bit darker, a little bit smaller. And those are just you know, just like humans, you'll get variabilities in insects and arthropods for uh, individuals and what they look like. 
This one doesn't do as good a job of looking like a dead leaf because it tends to like to hang out on the, the top there versus mm -hmm. on the branches. <laughs> but you can imagine if this was a, a, a forest with dead leaves, these guys would blend in quite well. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty cool little fellas. Uh, we've um, got a few different species. This is the largest of the species that we have, and so these are the ones we were able to get on display. Cool I see some movement in this case, this lower case over here. Oh, we're surrounded by bugs right now. Yeah, there's lots of <laughs> yep. crawling and creeping so, going on. Right here we have Madagascar hissing roaches, you know. Probably one of the animals that gets the biggest response. <laughs> the opposite response that the butterflies tend to get. A lot of people going, ooh, or oh, yuck, or just making all sorts of faces that even with masks on, we can tell they're making faces. <laughs> um, but these guys, like some counterparts I'll show you later, are really important to our health, believe it or not. Even though we consider them pests, the majority of cockroach species, the, the large majority, are not pests, um, human pests. Uh, these guys are great fruit eaters. These guys are and eat all sorts of um, stuff that we, we may not want. These guys get fresh fruit every day, but if they're living in Madagascar, they would rely on the fruit that has fallen from trees. So the fruit that's a bit more ripe, think about those really dark bananas that make great banana bread. Um, the, that's prime for them just to eat straight. And wow. to your left, Christina, we do have a giraffe stag beetle. Yeah. I think that's what Cassidy noticed. So one of the amazing beetles from Southeast Asia. You can tell the... Um, does it have a long neck? Is that why it's called well, a giraffe long, stag the long beetle? modified mandibles there, a modified carapace. So its neck, you know, they are, being an insect, they lack an actual neck. So they have elongated uh, head parts, which give them the name of the giraffe stag beetle. We have a male uh, and female in there. The uh, female um, hides the majority of the time. She'll come out to eat and to breed, and then she'll dig herself a little hole in the ground and hang out there. Where he is a active little fella. He likes to climb. Um, the way they eat, they essentially stick their face in their banana. So it's uh, if you've got a three-year-old at home, huh. maybe a two-year-old, <laughs> very similar eating habits. <laughs> and then above you is another one of those bugs that we like to. Um, in, in, um, in, let's see what we're hiding here in the corner. Not quite. Or... We like to introduce them because this is another strong reaction. If you pan up and left under that log in the corner. Oh yeah. Oh wow. And on the wall. Yeah, look that at that. That is a Trinidad chevron tarantula. Another bug or an arthropod that gets a horrible rep. <laughs> now, a lot of people have a strong reaction to these guys. And you know, it's like most animals, if you're aware of what you're dealing with, they pose very little threat to us. You know, tarantulas do bite. Most bites from a tarantula are gonna be akin to a wasp sting, which is not pleasant, but you know, usually not life-threatening. And they're not prone to come after you. You mostly have to invade their space and make them feel threatened. And some tarantulas get acclimated to humans pretty, pretty readily and get pretty docile by uh, wild animal standards. Hmm. So some folks fancy these as pets. You know, I uh, enjoy having them for display and being able to have these guys at work and helping use them as ambassadors to kind of introduce folks to the idea that bugs and their reputation aren't always earned. A lot of times it's out of fear and perhaps misunderstanding. And speaking of misunderstood animals, we're gonna leave the sideshow and kind of go on to the next part. Still part of the sideshow, I would say. But one of the most maligned animals are, of course, the roaches. And here we have our orange head roaches. We call this our bottomless pit, the home to a thousand mouths. And I'm sure there are probably some less than favorable reactions happening right now. <laughs> There's uh, perhaps a lot of ooing and aahing at home. And not in the ooh and ah baby way, but the ooh and ah. <laughs> However, I always like to ask people, Cassidy, what's your favorite food? Uh, pizza. Pizza. Who doesn't love pizza? Right? There's a common answer here. We get to thank roaches and other decomposers for pizza. When you think about your food sources, it always comes back to soil health, something we're well aware of at the garden, but not a lot of people equate when it comes to their favorite foods. I tell people ice cream is my favorite food group. And with ice cream, you can take it back to dairy, which is to cows, and cows eat grass, and grass requires good soil health, and decomposers such as roaches are great for soil health. They help um, recycle nutrients, old fruits and, and vegetables, and things that have fallen to the forest floor that allow them to um, 
that they like that we won't, don't necessarily want to mess with, and they turn that into soil nutrients. No. And is this, is this all the same kind of rose? These are two all, different, the, all the same. like male and female? Or? There are young and old in there. So the old, the adults are the ones with the wings, and the juveniles are the ones without wings. Mm, okay. So this is a, this is a self-propagating colony. Do they fly out of the top here? Yeah, that's what people get surprised to find out all of a sudden, boom. Oh, look, my hands are there. <laughs> These guys, have, their wings are mainly for graceful falling. They don't have powered flight. These guys are not very good climbers, so it allows us to display them in an open air um, spot without the worry of them climbing up and, and coming out to join us. So they get to stay where they hmm. are. So not all wings are made equally. These <laughs> guys, um, you know, if you're high up in a tree and you get spooked and you need to fall to the ground relatively gracefully, having some sort of wings will help. So it'll be useful for me when I climb trees. I'm not the, the most graceful. So what we'll do next, I think, is we'll head into our main event where um, the flying life adopterans perform, our beautiful butterflies. So we'll head into the conservatory where it's going to be a little hot and humid. So it might take some camera adjustment just to, so folks, if you see everything get hazy at home, it's not your eyes. It's just the camera adjusting the humidity. Um, in order to get through our vestibule, this is a quarantine facility. It's, a, it's kind of prescient because we want to make sure our butterflies stay where they're supposed to stay. And it's, well, we don't, we don't want them to escape mostly because we're worried about them thriving here because these are tropical butterflies. But butterflies can carry diseases. They can carry parasites that could infect our local populations. So we don't want to introduce a novel pathogen into the wild here. So we are a quarantine facility, so we'll have one door open at each time. So it's kind of similar to what we're dealing with right now, trying to, with a novel pathogen, we want to make sure we're not we're creating that here. So when we head in, what I'll do is I'll go in first. I will clean the touch point. I'll let you guys enter. Just make sure one door is shut at all times so when the back door closes, you guys can enter and then I'll follow you in afterwards. So if you guys want to hang out here on our beautiful social distance dock, I will go in and get the door cut for you. And while we're waiting, I don't know if we uh, mentioned it off the top or not, but for people who aren't familiar with the Butterfly House, um, it is in Faust Park in Chesterfield, so uh, lots of great stuff to do around here, nice walking trails and things as well. Uh, but if you're curious where the Butterfly House is, I know sometimes we have people show up at the main garden campus right, asking yeah. about the butterflies, but this is out in Chesterfield in Faust Park. So That's one of the cool things about you know, the garden of three properties we have, wherever you are in the St. Louis area, you're near to one of us, so mm -hmm. on the south side. I guess our, our St. Charles friends have a little bit of a distance uh, to go for all of them. But we're, as mentioned, Chesterfield, right across. We're actually almost right next to the, uh, the river in Faust Park. So just a short drive from anywhere in the metro area. So if you guys want to head in, I'll close this door behind you and then let you guys open and head in and then I'll catch up. All right. It does feel very tropical. It does. Lots of butterflies. Yeah. yeah. I know at home you can't feel it, but it's like a tropical paradise in here. It gets a little warm on the, in the afternoons and humid, but we're home to anywhere between 1,000 and 1,500 butterflies that are doing all their butterfly things, uh, flying around. Um, that is either courtship or anti-courtship. Two butterflies getting to know each other better. If it's two males, they're competing. If it's male and female, well, and those, right. are, and those are blue morphos? Those are blue morphos around, flying around. lots of them. Mm -hmm. yeah, those are probably the ones that are the easiest to spot. That flashy blue when they're in flight. They're one of the largest butterflies we have in here. Um, these are all butterflies from the tropics, from Central and South America, from uh, a few from Asia and Africa as well, but the predominant number of them are from Central and South America. So you'll see the morphos, you'll see heliconia species which are the long wings, um, a wide variety. We, uh, Get our butterflies in the pupil form, which we'll be able to show you about emergency people a little bit later, from sustainable farms in Central and South America. And 
what we get in is kind of depending on how the breeding season is going for them. So we can ask for certain things during uh, Morpho Mardi Gras. We ask if they can send us a higher proportion of blue Morpho so we can fill this space with blue as much as possible. But by and large, um, it's kind of like a Christmas every uh, Thursday when we get a new shipment in. It's like, well, what do we get this time? There's, there's common ones that obviously bleed very well at the farm, but every now and again we get some surprises. We got one I've never seen in here today called a vine. Let's see if we can't find that for you. It's a beautiful black and white butterfly. But um, as we walk through here with the big top theme, we're showcasing not just the flying web adopter and the butterfly, but also the food source for these guys, the, the greenery in here, the plants in here. You know, we've got a little bit of a different uh, purpose for it than just display. This is the food source for the butterflies. Flying is, takes a lot of energy, so you need a very energy-rich food source. And for the majority of butterflies, that's the nectar sources that are in here. There's a few exceptions which we'll, I'll point out as we go on. But one of the things we like to hear with folks that are plants, a lot of cool stuff that happens in them, a lot of fun different varieties as we well know. And uh, we do a highlight here, plants that play with fire. So a little walk through fire here, some little coleus and coscus and zora plants that uh, some of the, the fun parts of the botanical side is seeing what people decided to call them. Mm -hmm. well, and the different varieties that and cultivars that the folks can come up with. The other added piece of our botanical collection that we have to make sure about is any plant that we provide in here can be a food source for butterflies, but can't be a food source for cat or caterpillars. So we don't, or we're not a breeding facility. That's something, something that we requested permits for, and it, it would also um, provide a bit more of a challenge because caterpillars, the teenagers of butterflies, are voracious eaters. So it would be obvious if we had caterpillars flying around in here. Well, they wouldn't find growing in here and eating. So all of the plants, not only do we make sure that they're safe for butterflies, but we also make sure they're not a good host plant for the butterflies themselves, um, which is relatively easy because butterflies are specific about which plants they consider host plants. So they only recognize certain types of plants as sources for their eggs or for their caterpillars. So we just make sure that we don't plant any of those in here. And speaking of food sources, we'll head down this way. We highlight some of the the food themed plants in here as well. We have a balsam apple tree, also called a signature tree here. Blue ginger. But the majority of these are butterfly food. Things like the pintas and the porterweed. These are all important nectar sources for these guys. And I think that's one of the things I'm, I'm most proud of in here is that we are able to provide the food needs for these butterflies without supplementing them with nectar, with artificial nectar. So our horticulture team is able to keep these flowering year round enough that we can maintain a healthy butterfly population without having to supplement artificial nectar. Now not all of them are nectar eaters. We do have some like blue morphos that won't visit a flower for nectar in the lifetime. They'll eat fruit as well. So we have fruit, fruit trays throughout the uh, conservatory as well. No one's dining on this delicious overripe pear right now. We also add some electrolytes on there, which is the red powder on there. Butterflies do something called puddling, which is where they come down to the ground and get nutrients out of the puddle. One of the ways we can help reduce that is by providing electrolytes on the on the plant on the fruits as well. And I've heard the blue morphos like beer as well. Yeah so you know butterflies when they're eating fruits in a the while they're not eating the, the ones that we would that are perfect and firm and delicious. They want the ones that have overripened to the point where they have fallen off of the, the tree and are starting to ferment. So we're not buying fruit that have started to ferment, so we aid that process with beer. Expired beer because, you know, as an adult, uh, otherwise it might be a waste. So we're able to <laughs> um, get partners that are willing to share with us their beer that is perhaps past the shelf life a little bit. And the butterflies, they don't mind. They don't worry about the, the born on days. So they're uh, just, we pour that on there, let that help attract them, and let them get the, the most delicious, overripe, nearly fermented fruit that they can, and help uh, get them there and get them to fly. Good question. People will come into our lab and see the beer bottles and assume that <laughs> entomologists are just a hard partying bunch. <laughs> really, it's for the butterflies.
Are these paper kite butterflies? Those are paper kites. Got two of them right there. Yeah, just, just hanging out. Oh. Well, when we come here in the morning, often that's when you'll find a lot of them doing their roosting from overnight. But not necessarily getting started with flight until it gets a little bit warmer. Being ectothermic animals, their energy level corresponds with how warm the environment is. So the warmer the environment, more active they can be. Uh, we have a question from Jim. He's wondering how long the butterflies typically survive while they're here. That's a good question. When we talk about butterfly life, uh, lifespan, it depends on what you want to measure. You measure from emerging from the egg through the end of their adult life. That can be depending upon where they're at, where they're found, because they might overwinter in their model of people stage. But most of the people are asking about the adult butterflies. And it depends on the species. Uh, we do have some butterflies that will live in here up to a, two or three months would be the, the, the end of that, the, the longest. Usually this could be a couple of weeks. There are some Lepidoptin species that don't have mouth parts. So they actually come out, do no eating. It's a, a rush to find a mate before they expire. Wow. Um, the majority of ours, though, there's a, a, lot, a lot of the mobs are like that. Uh, the butterflies here are sipping the nectar. So, my best guess would be a few weeks, and the rare occasions are a few months. Well, this is kind of an interesting flower here. Right? This is uh, tropical milkweed. Isn't Correct. It? Yes. Uh, so, the, the tropical cousin of the the monarchs, the, the plants that that monarchs. Uh, right. We were talking about host plants earlier. So, right. for the native monarchs or the the uh, migrating monarchs that people might see in their own gardens right now, that like milkweed. This is a tropical tropical cousin right yeah that's the tropical version so it's um you know one of the things that science is starting to find out is how that mysterious migration works and there's some evidence that the tropical milkweed plays a part in that and when it's found in the wrong spots it can actually disrupt the migration so one thing we do recommend is that if you're planting milkweed for monarchs that you're planting local milkweed versus tropical milkweed so we don't have monarchs in here so we're all, this is a host plant for them but not for any of the others that we got out of here So I'm not sure if you noticed, and I don't want to alarm you, but behind you there is an elephant. <laughs> so we're in the menagerie part of our big top. Oh yeah, that's great. So the uh, plants in here, there's a lot of animal themed plants. When you take a look around, we have scorpion tail, the porter weed is also called rat's tails. We have cat's whiskers right next to us. All three of those are great nectar sources for the main animal in here, the, the flying butterflies. We also have highlighting some of our plant collection. We have our lion's den over here. Which is home not just to lion's ears, but also our lion tamer is right next door to us hibiscus with a bud on it getting ready to flower. It's a beautiful oh, yeah. dusky yellow. If you've ever been near a lion, that dusky yellow, the flower is very reminiscent of that. Beautiful plant. And a little cucumber vine hanging out there. That's another great um, food source for the, the butterfly. One of the things that we like to do on tours, something that's part of our job that we have to do every day is you know, butterflies come out of their pupa the people in our emergence case, then they have to find their way in here. So we transport them in here and release them. That's something that usually we do right at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, but during our guided tours, we do a release for our tour participants. So if you choose to come on Mondays and sign up for one of our tours that is a course an added fee for everyone but festival members, um, we, uh, as long as we have a butterfly for release, we will include that in the tour. So we do have a staff over here. Can you wait till you hear them Sure. <laughs> yeah, some more animal themed plants over here. Elephant ears and the zebra plant. Oh, butterflies. Oh, yeah. So these are some newly emerged butterflies. Off the presses this morning. They tend to emerge in the morning. And let them take their first flight and go in the country. Uh, yeah. Ooh. Ooh. This 
is a clipper. So a clipper thing in there. Looks like we've got a long wing and a morpho. Now you're gonna have to keep your eyes because when they go, they don't they don't hang out and say thank you. <laughs> Off they go to go and the rest of the town too. So about how many butterflies do you have in here at any given time? We try to manage to keep between a thousand and fifteen hundred in any case. Well obviously it's very hard to keep an accurate count. Um, if anyone's looking for a project they want to count butterflies. I can just laugh at them. But we estimate based on the number of people we get as well as the emergency success that we have between a thousand and fifteen hundred a day based on emergency success as well as the number of people we can get in based on what's going on in the farm. We try to keep a pretty full conservatory, but not so full that it's uh, detrimental to the So as we wind around the last half, what we always share with folks as we go through here to take a look at the code. We call this part the grand finale. It allows us to focus on the colors you see in the conservatory. And the colors aren't just the butterflies, but also the plants as well, the flowers. And one of the, the downsides to being human is that our eyes aren't, don't take in the full color spectrum that's out in the world. Insects and flowers use ultraviolet light to advance. Look at the flowers. The flowers, of course, are trying to convince a butterfly to come visit them so that they can sneak a little pollen onto them and deliver that to the next plant. So they need to get a courier and they, they drive the courier with the sweet nectar. So the nectar production for, for the pollinators that come in, pollinators come get the nectar and carry it to the next plant and voila, we have bees. The uh, flowers that we see are just the visible spectrum to us. We also use UV light, and we call nectar dyes, that help highlight where the nectar is and bring in the, the bees and the butterflies and all those other wonderful pollinators that are going to help transport pollen from a male flower to a female flower. So as we walk through here, we try to highlight the light purples, the dark purples, the reds, the yellows, and uh, realizing that that's only a percentage of the, the colors that these flowers are going to have. Oh, here we go. One of them snacking on the fruit oh, yeah, over yeah. here. Yeah, good look at that proboscis. And this one, enjoying the juice that is running off the bottom of that there. A little bit of the juice this run is a, This is a pretty one here with the green and the malachite. And you can kind of tell the age of these guys by their wings. That one's wings are a little bit beat up. That one's been here a little bit longer. The new ones that just came out, by and large, are going to have nice edges to the wings because they're not going to have been through the rigors of life for a butterfly, which, of course, here we don't have any predators to really worry about, but it's other butterflies competing for space. Because, um, male butterflies are still going to keep the space in here, even though we don't have host plants. They're going to go through all the natural behaviors to try to breed, um, and then the females just will not will have a place where they feel they can lay their eggs, so they'll either reabsorb them or dump them. And the cat does not survive, so it allows us to maintain the population in here and not, not accidentally breed. Some of you are not allowed to do because we're asking the permits and not really want that to happen as well. But speaking of babies, we're talking about caterpillars and keep the up here we have our emergency. Now there was some exciting news announced today that we did get awarded a grant to help us expand our entomology lab. So Oh wow. We were, we were oh my goodness. Back in hopefully eight months to a year, this space will be redefined. A chance for us to showcase what our entomology team does. Obviously the, the horticulture team gets to be center stage with all the beautiful plant life here. The entomology team does a lot more than just the butterflies, and this will help showcase it. So what you're looking at now, yeah, it's like the size, the size of my yeah. Yeah, That's an atlas moth. Wow. So that's one of those um, lepidopterans that lacks mouth parts. Oh wow, so, so they have a short lifespan then. Right, it's, it's a race once they become adults. So they'll stay in that, that cocoon for a while. So they'll stay in there for months sometimes. 
and when they emerge, it's just a race to find a mate before uh, Mother Nature takes its toll. And we have other butterflies that are in the process of emerging. Uh, some of these are obviously already successful. Some of them struggle. Emerging from, just because you make it to the stage doesn't mean you're going to fully make it into an adult butterfly. You have to get out of your chrysalid and then you have to pump the fluid from your abdomen into your wings. Make sure that those get fully extended and then dry before you come across any sort of mishap. So our entomology team in the morning and then later in the afternoon they'll go through and even ones that have successfully emerged off of their chrysalid will be released out here. And I don't know if everybody uh, watching at home can can see the tiny little pins uh, mm -hmm. on these foam boards because these these are all of these chrysalids are individually pinned to replicate where they would normally in in nature have attached yeah. to a plant or something to hang right yeah right? They, uh, the caterpillars will use usually a, some sort of silk to attach themselves to um, a plant or a twig and that's where the, the pupa will develop inside the chrysalis and so for them to emerge appropriately they have to have space because when they come out and they're filling their wings if they've got a neighbor and they're trying to do the same time that could hinder how well they emerge also you know a lot of them are designed to be hanging from something others are actually put in the sling and one of the things that we are planning on trying to do soon is see if we can't mimic that through a different um, setup where we're putting the, the upright chrysalids in almost like a test tube holders, see if that has any difference on how well they emerge, if there's a difference in emergence uh, success or if it's exactly the same. It is a bit laborious to pin these. Um, if there's not a good spot to pin, you might see some little pieces of paper that these are hot glued to. So the hot glue, of course, doesn't harm them. It gives them something to stick to, and then we can pin that to the foam board. And then the, uh, the moth cocoons are big and papery, so we can actually stick that hook right through it without damaging the developing. Well, and I noticed, and not to keep, I mean, this guy just demands right attention because yeah. yeah. he's so big, but I mean, you can see through, there's, there's like clear sections of the wing where you can actually right, yeah. see through it. They use these patterns for so many different things, you know, the, um, and it's competing for a lot of these animals, they, especially if you're a male, although it, it's true for females as well, you want to both attract attention and not become food at the same time. Mm. So the morphos are kind of a fun example of that because when their wings are closed, they have those eye spots and they're uh, drab brown, so they presumably blend in a little bit better. And then when they need to show a flash of color, they can open their wings. So at rest while sleeping, they're a little more camouflaged. Some of these others though, it seems like that hasn't paid them dividends, so they are out there and advertising all the time because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the uh, risk of predation doesn't outweigh the risk of not finding a mate. Well, especially, I guess, with one like that where its lifespan is so short anyway. Right, right. You're, you're going to... You know, what, what's the risk there? You're not going to live that long anyway, so might, might as well be as gaudy and flashy. Yeah. <laughs> now, these guys are nocturnal, so bright colors aren't necessarily going to help them a whole lot because they're not going to be active during the day when the colors are as apparent. So this one's very strikingly patterned, but not strikingly bright. Not so where do those moths come from? Atlas moths are from the whole... I don't mean to put you on the no, spot you're either. The spot. <laughs> I do not remember off the top of my head. I don't want to tell you incorrectly. Well, if any of our viewers know, or um, if you guys want to look on Google and drop it in the comments, please feel free. Again, it's the Atlas Moth. Atlas Moth, yeah, I can find that out very quickly as well. This is one of those facts that I should have on top of my head, and then when you ask it, I'm ready to answer it, I'm like, I'm wrong. <laughs> Forest of Asia, so is an Gotcha. Which is totally what I was going to say the first time. <laughs> you never know how much we So that's pretty much our, our entire flight house. You know, our mission, of course, is to you know, introduce people to the world of butterflies and bugs, and you know, get them to realize, see some beauty, and appreciate them. But we also want folks to translate that into action closer to home. So 
we always tell people on tours that I'm not going to expect you to become best friends with all the bugs in the world, but hopefully we can become good neighbors. And part of being good neighbors is realizing what's out there. So our next stop is going to be the native garden. And so that is a space that's designed to promote native wildlife, whether it's um, bugs like butterflies, other pollinators such as wasps and bees, as well as frogs, turtles, seeing a raccoon back there. So our exits can be very similar to our entrance where I'll go through, I'll clean, and then I'll invite you guys in, and then I'll meet you out in the main hall. Sounds good. And again, for anybody who's just tuning in, we are not at the garden today. Um, we are at the butterfly house, which is another site of the garden, but it is not um, in the city. It's out in Chesterfield, and that is where this conservatory is located. And what we're doing right now is the same uh, containment procedures we used to get in, uh, where we're we're going through a double door process to make sure none of the butterfly friends escape with us. So I think we're good to go Hitch through. Our first. Once you're in, just check for hitchhikers. And then let me get this door shut before you open the next. Do I have any butterflies? <laughs> no. Okay, good. I'll meet you in the hall. All right. So you shut that door, and it's cooler, and there's a little bit of a breeze. And again, we've got these mirrors to check for butterflies mm -hmm. and make sure that we don't have any. Hitchhikers on us, that's part of the quarantine process. You can really feel the difference in humidity oh, again. Sure. Yeah. It's uh it gets a little bit warm in there. Oh, we're, our, we're set up in here a little bit different. This is our flea circus. Um, today we have our discovery tables out for our small group tours. Um, when we're open to the general public, we have our, our bee movie showing um, as part of the flea circus. Some amazing small animals, plus a little tower of tiny bugs that are in there. Yeah. Um, in there is also one of our other confiscated mantises. I have a boxer mantis at the bottom, which they are hard to find in here because they're a small mantis with large forelimbs, which makes them look like they're a boxer. So a boxer oh. is in a the fighter boxer, a sport boxer. So some good exploring to do here if you want to try to find the small animals, the tiny animals, pill bugs, a cellar spider, mealworms, and our ivory boxer mantis. And that's a piece of styrofoam in there, right? Because that's, mealworms will actually eat styrofoam, is that? Um, I've seen the studies that show waxworms do that. Mealworms very well might as also. Um, there's plenty of holes in it, so it yeah. looks like they're digging their way through it. So uh, I, the answer appears to be yes. <laughs> All right, so let's head on out to the back garden and see what what locals can find. So as opposed to a well manicured garden, this is a space that is designed to be a backyard habitat for wildlife. So something that hopefully is appealing, but also provides plenty of respite for bugs, for birds. We've, uh, as you mentioned, we've seen turtles back here as well, our pond. Um, plenty of pollinators. We find chrysalids back here every now and again. Um, so I hear a bird calling right now, hanging out. Some of these uh, flowers that have gone past their prime, you see a lot of goldfinches out here. When you take a look at the cone flowers, once those guys, they're, um, they seed out and the petals drop, you know, often we're gonna wanna you know, as a horticulturist, we want to deadhead them to get them reflowering, but leaving them past that point provides a spot for the goldfinches because they'll come in and pick those seeds up. So then having them seeds early might take away food sources from the locals. So you know, it's kind of that balance between having it look perfect and beautiful versus um, accepting a little bit of the imperfect so that that benefits yeah. the wildlife as well. I have seen a lot of goldfinches around lately too. So yeah, well, they, and they are always on those right, big right. cone flowers. So uh, you know. One of the lessons that we try to share with people is you know, how you, when you're looking at your own garden, your own lawn, how do you manage it to make it acceptable for wildlife, leaving it go past what many of us would consider that perfect, beautiful prime? Because that 
some of the dead leaves or the dead grasses, for example, provide homes, overwintering homes for bugs. Because obviously, our tropical bugs don't have to worry about those freezing weather, but our local population has to find a way of, of surviving on Missouri winters and finding spots such as dead grasses, piles of leaves to overwinter in are a good thing. So if we completely manicure every space we have, we're providing a little bit less space for our local pollen and local bugs to thrive. So it's kind of just a, a nice spot, a nice tranquil spot often at the butterfly house you go through. Um, not everyone makes it out here. And one of the things we're trying to do is make sure people aware that this is a spot out here to enjoy. Obviously the butterflies are, are what people come for, but there's plenty of butterflies out here. You just have to look a little bit harder for them. Plus, I'm seeing a lot of dragonflies mm -hmm. hanging out right now. I just saw one light over there. See, I don't know if you can see that grass. Um, yeah, I saw it land. I'm not sure how well it shows up on the yeah. screens, but... So you'll see a lot of dragonflies finding perches out here to chase away any potential, especially in males, chasing away other males so they get a chance to breed with the females. And finding the, the ideal spot. Obviously, but, uh, dragonfly nymphs live in water. So having a water source for those dragonflies to uh, lay their eggs in and to have the nymphs grow and become more dragonflies, let them help control uh, the insect population. Because just like everything else, as much as we love all the bugs, there's a balance for that as well. So dragonflies being predators allow, helps keep a lot of the populations in check. Um, they will eat the students as well, so that's always a good thing. It's a great thing. <laughs> Although mosquitoes are not aligned too, the males are pollinators. So uh, the females are the ones that use our blood for the protein to make their eggs or the energy source to make their eggs, but the males don't bite us at all. They're the ones that uh, pollinate several species of plants. So again, balance in there as well. We need the mosquitoes, even though we don't necessarily want them. So whenever they take a little blood from me, I just try to think that I'm helping pollinate a flower. <laughs> And I wanted to point out as well, I mean, we talked about the Butterfly House being a site of the Missouri Botanical Garden. And we do have, just like at the garden, um, and at spots uh, at Shaw Nature Reserve mm -hmm. as well, these labels. So if people are out, um, both in the conservatory uh, for the tropical plants and then, and then back out here, um, most of the plants are labeled um, with that common name, species name, plant family, and then uh, where in the world they can be found. So right, lots yeah. of great plant information and that's uh, a feature of the Botanical Garden that you see across all three sites of these plant labels. Absolutely. And especially if we're gonna promote, uh, trying to promote folks to make backyard wildlife habitats, knowing what to plant that is appropriate for Missouri um, is important. Butterflies. Here's, some and here's an example of what you were just talking about. Right. So leaving on that yeah. cone head with those seeds so the goldfinches can eat. And I, I have some cone flower in my backyard and I'd never seen goldfinches in my backyard until I planted some cone flower mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden there's I've got one little ye bright yellow buddy every day that just comes <laughs> and hangs out on the cone flower. Yeah, the, you know, the flower's life, uh, the seeds, when we think about being a, uh, a butterfly house, we think a lot about, and a lot of horticulture think about the nectars and the goodness um, they provide for the bugs, but all sorts of wildlife uh, thrive when they have the right plant materials in the right stages for them. So those seeds to get ready, especially as fall starts approaching, all those birds need to add on a little bit extra weight. Seeds are nice high fat content, a lot of them, to help them get ready for the, either a migration or an overwintering. Um, just like just as the pollen or, or the uh, nectar do the same thing for some of the insects as well. So, you know, learning how to manage it for wildlife is a little bit different than learning how to manage it just for display. And, uh, you know, all of us are going to have to figure out exactly what that balance we want is based on where we're living and what we want to encourage. You know, even even deer, probably the, the least, the animal a lot of uh, plant growers are least affectionate of. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're a part of the healthy, healthy ecosystem as well. Doesn't mean we want to feed them our entire garden. However, they, they have a place in there as well. Sounds like there's a great gold finches and other birds. Um, we have uh, some winter burying plants out here for um, birds as well. Beautyberry tends to um, bury near late fall and into the winter. 
green when they're running another important food source for them. We have some beetleberry around the corner here, but it's not going to be very spectacular right now just because it's not, mm -hmm. well, it's going to be green, but it's not going to be flowering or in, uh, in berries. And we have an, a fun perimeter spot, but then if you really want to explore, we've got some more wild areas. Should we explore? Yeah, Let's we take should. A through here. For the adventurers who might want to travel through and around and over some plants, it's hard to trim these guys when they're in such beautiful flowers. Yeah, yeah. I this is the prairie dock that we saw last week out at Shaw Nature Reserve. Oh, area. yeah. It's the real coarse leaves. Um, Andy out of Shaw Nature Reserve was, was introducing us to that plant last week. Awesome, so, yeah. Tons so, of it. I mean, some, yeah. of this, some of this stuff is eight foot tall. Yeah, we've got plant right plants. here. Is, you know, towering over us makes us feel almost bug-like, small, and in this world, these plants uh, yeah. provide a fun, uh, um, hey, I'm sorry, I just got distracted to see a lot of bees. I'm probably going to be hard to get up, up on that cup plant. And as we travel through here, through this, this wild spot, you can see a lot of like, some honeybees visiting the cup plant. Actually, is that, once I, now that my eyes are open to them, I'm seeing them all over the place. Yeah. And we'll see honeybees such as this guy pollinating. We'll also see uh, carpenter bees out here, bumblebees. Uh, these are some of our favorite pollinator friends. They're great pollinators. Um, honeybees, obviously, we utilize for the honey, but the native bees. Um, are arguably more important for a lot of our native wildlife and a lot of our native flowers. You guys can hear all the birds. Yeah. And bugs too. Yeah. Some dragonflies chasing each other. I saw a new thing at my house the other day. It was not too, not too far from here. I saw a bee chasing a hummingbird. Really? <laughs> and vice versa. Yeah, it went on for a while. That's, That's funny. That's funny. Now, it's not uncommon for us to find um, chrysalids and caterpillars out here. Uh, we have some of my coworkers have a much better eye for those than I do. Well, and, I mean, this interspersed throughout here is yeah. all this uh, milkweed. Um, I think this is some, and mm -hmm. so checking the underside, especially when you see a leaf that has uh, clearly been yeah, snacked yeah. on. Someone's had fun. That mm -hmm. can, yeah, it can help uh, if you're looking, trying to find uh, monarch caterpillars. And we, you know, milkweed's great for monarchs. We have uh, parsley for some of the swallowtails. Um, so researching a little bit of what host plant you plant will kind of dictate what, what butterflies you're going to eventually see out there. Butterflies and or moths. So of course moths are a huge part of the pollination equation. Uh, arguably larger than the butterflies, just active at night. And so we don't see them as often, we don't think about them as often. But uh, they're, like I said, arguably more important than the butterflies when it comes to pollination. So providing sources for the moths as well is great for having a thriving ecosystem. And as I mentioned, uh, there's the, the beautyberry that's now flowering, so we could be getting... This here on the left is no, the beautyberry? Yep. Oh yeah, you can see. And in winter, these turn this like deep magenta yeah, color. Yeah, these guys are actually, uh, this is earlier than I expected to see them. Yeah. I'm not a uh, beautyberry expert, however, so uh, this might be completely normal. But I think they don't... Yeah, they don't change to that purple, purple. color until later. Yeah, I mean, I've seen them on the plant for a long yeah. time. So even if like they in plant, January, yeah. they'll be the one thing in the landscape that's not gray or brown. Another bee. A 
Papua tree yes. here as well, and that's, um, we're talking about host plants, that's a host for one of the swallowtails, I think. I would have to look uh, it up to know for sure. I want to say the zebra swallowtail, maybe? I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure there's a swallowtail that uh, has the, uses the pawpaw as a host plant. You can see some fruit on this one. Yeah. And some spots where something has been yep. snacking on the leaves. I know spice bush, that's an, always an easy one for me for right. the spice bush swallowtail. Right. That's another native shrub. Oh, I know Shaw's got their plant pickup sale going on right mm -hmm. now. And they're going to focus just like we would do with our plant sale on a lot of the natives. So things that are great for our local wildlife and to have in your. Uh, their own backyard to provide not just something that's beautiful, but something that helps um, promote balance for all the animals that are around here. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, you know, this is about everywhere we've got with the Butterfly House. We're not the largest facility, but uh, we try to pack a lot in what we have. We encourage folks to come out here and do as much exploring as they want. I spend some time inside just kind of taking in the uh, beauty of the butterflies. And depending on your tolerance for heat and humidity in the winter, of course, people tend to linger a little bit longer. Um, but just a nice peaceful spot in there. And then come out to our back garden and uh, doing a little bit more exploring to see what can be found out here that is provided not necessarily by us, we provide the plants, but Mother Nature provides the rest. Can you remind us again of the, the hours and, uh, and sure. how people can come out and experience this? Um, like all garden sites, we are asking everyone to buy tickets in advance on the website. We are currently open to general admission Tuesday through Sunday on Mondays until the end of August. We are doing small group tours that you can also book those tickets online. And until Labor Day, we'll be opening at 9 a.m. After Labor Day, we'll, we'll be opening at 10 a.m. and 10 to 4. We're closing at 4 all the days. Awesome. I hope to see folks out here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the tour. You're very welcome. And thank you everyone for tuning in. We are going to sign off and we'll see you next time.